I am David Lee Tex Hill, born July 13, 1915, Kwangju, Korea. My dad was a Protestant missionary there and uh, came back to the States. His health broke down and I was the youngest of our family. And uh, <clears throat> I was only a year and a half old when we left Korea. Came into Virginia and I, uh, my dad got his health back. He had a farm there and that's where all our people are from. And uh, he got his health back and he was going to go back and uh, he was called to the uh, uh, First Presbyterian Church in San Antonio, Texas. And I grew up there. We moved there in 1921. My sister was a very good looking gal and I uh, had a cousin that was good looking. And all these cadets used to come around the house when I was a little kid, you know, in the helmet and goggles and stuff out of Kelly Field. And that kind of motivated me. I thought that was pretty cool, you know. And I, uh, uh, that motivated me to some extent. And then one day I had to go fly an airplane, you know, so I took my collection money and another guy named Chet Sluter and I uh, pooled our resources and went out to Winburn Field and and I uh, got a ride around the pattern with the uh, an old travel air. And that uh, that really got me hooked. So uh, well, I made a lot of model airplanes and stuff when I was a kid, like most kids were interested in aviation. And, uh, I didn't uh, do anything about it until I, until I uh, got to college. And, and Well, I, I wanted to get in the Navy when I was uh, I, when I got out of high school, and my t folks talked me out of it and said, if you go to college, get a degree, you can still go in the Navy, but you, uh, you know, you got a better shot at becoming an officer and getting into flight training. So I did that, and I'm very thankful I did. And you had to have a degree when you uh, to go to the Navy at that time. So when I graduated from Austin College, I went to right straight in the Navy. You had to enlist as a second class seaman. Then they sent you down to Pensacola. I mean down to Opelika, the old Marine base down there near uh, Miami for uh, boot training and uh, elimination flight training. Well, they, they, <clears throat> to save the government a little money, <laughs> they to send you down to see if you had any aptitude to fly. And all they did was solo you. And if you could solo, they gave you seven hours, eight hours. And uh, survived that and they sent me to Pensacola and, and uh, it's pretty tough getting in. We started out with a hundred people there. I rode my motorcycle from Austin College down to Dallas to take my physical and there were only uh, 12 of us that were selected out of that. And then we went on down to Opelika and then there was only eight of us. That, I mean ten of us went to Pensacola and then eight of us graduated out of that class. So it was Pretty tough training. I went to the fleet. I was assigned to the Saratoga, flying uh, TBDs, uh, torpedo planes, and uh, I flew them for a year on the Sarah. Uh, then I was transferred to the Ranger. Uh, <clears throat> the and uh, the Ranger uh, at that time we, I was flying uh, SB2U dive bombers, and so I was in bombing. Four, which was later redesignated Scouting 41. And uh, so I flew those while I was on the Ranger, and then I made one cruise on the Yorktown flying. We switched air groups, and I was flying uh, uh, SB2Us on that. The uh, uh, Chinese Air Force was in name only. And uh, they figured to keep China in the war that they needed an instant air force. And the only way they could get in from the Air Force was to recruit professionals out of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. So uh, Chenault came to the States, presented his plan, and uh, it was rejected by Admiral Tower, uh, Hap Arnold, uh, George Marshall, uh, Secretary Stimson, and uh, they were all against it. So uh, Chenault I had a friend, uh, Joe Alsop, who was a very famous uh, uh, editorial guy. But anyway, uh, he had uh, President Roosevelt's ear. He was kin to him some way, I don't know. It might have been a distant cousin. But anyway, he got Chenault an audience with him. And Chenault convinced 
Roosevelt that this was necessary if we want to keep China in the war. So, uh, by presidential decree, they allowed the recruiters to come on base. And, uh, and I, at that time, I was at Norfolk. And uh, I came down off a flight, and there were three of us went into we. I mean, they, we, we'd been on a cruise. We came into Norfolk. And uh, so when we came down off this flight, uh, we went into the operations building, uh, Bert Christman, me, uh, and Ed Rector. And uh, there was a commander, Irvine, that was there. And a guy named Gus Whittingham was our operations guy. And he said, here's some guys who go with you, you know, you know he's a man tight anyway. And, and I said, well, go where? He said, go to Burma. But, uh, and he introduced us to uh, uh, Commander Irvine, and, and uh, Irvine explained what they wanted. They wanted some recruits to go to keep the Burma Road open, keep the supplies flowing into China. So uh, uh, we didn't know where Burma was. You know, he pulled a map down and said, "This is Burma, and this is Burma Road." So we all volunteered. There were six of us off at Carrier that uh, volunteered to go. Well, we didn't think anything about it. We shoved off on another cruise and came back in, and uh, here he was with the contracts. So we signed the contracts, and our contracts uh, called for uh, uh, a flight leader, I mean a, a wingman, got $600 a month, flight leader 650 squadron leader got uh, 750 and uh, that was very high pay, you know, in that time. And also, it wasn't written in the contract that we'd get a $500 bonus for each airplane we just happened to shoot down. You know. So, anyway, we uh, gathered there at the uh, Bellevue Hotel in uh, San Francisco and headed out uh, on the Dutch ship. Uh, the Java Pacific Line headed out for uh, Burma. We went through to uh, Honolulu. From Honolulu went to Australia. And uh, it was, was kind of interesting because the Salt Lake City in the Utah, uh, Salt Lake City and uh, another heavy, Northampton, were coming out. They had escorted the first contingent of our people over there to protect them. And uh, see, the Dutch were at war with the Japs at that time. And uh, so the ambassador met us, and he said to him, man, he said, I've got headaches like you won't believe. He said, <clears throat> all the diggers are all fighting a the war there in, in, uh, in uh, Australia. And he said, they had a ratio of five to one of women to men. So when those sailors came ashore, the women just swarmed on them, you know. And they thought they'd died and gone to heaven. He said, I've been rounding up sailors that jump ship. <laughs> and I've been rounding them up for a week. So oh, anyway, it was uh, pretty interesting. Anyway, we went on up to the Bering Sea, up to the Philippines, through Manila. And then from Manila, we went on into, uh, uh, let's see, went into Batavia. Uh, which is Jakarta now, uh, that's East India. Went from there to Singapore, and Singapore to Surabaya, and then we changed to a Norwegian ship. And uh, quite a come down from the Dutch ship we were on. They had uh, three, three uh, Norwegian key people, skipper, first mate, a radio operator, and the rest were all Chinese, Chinese regiment. And we made it on into Rangoon, landed Rangoon immediately. Uh, well, we had time to have a drink over that Silver Grill, a very famous bar there. And then we they put us on a train and headed up for uh, uh, Tungu, which is 180 some miles north of Rangoon for our tra training. And so we trained at a field called Keto up there, which is British, it was a British field. And it had a paved runway, it was 4,000 feet, it was McCallum. And uh, we uh, 
went through a flight training there, consisted of uh, checking out in the P-40, which the Navy guys had never seen anything like it. We all had round engines. So and then uh, Chenault gave us 60 hours of tactical lectures. General Chenault uh, was a very dynamic person. And uh, this guy, this guy just exuded. You have confidence right once you meet the guy, you know he's he knows what he's talking about. And <clears throat> he had observed these people, you know, for seven years, almost eight years over there. So he knew all the characteristics of the Japanese airplanes. Uh, and he had a Hawk 75 that he flew. And uh, so he, he was able to observe the performance of these. That's really the tactics. He knew how to tell us how to handle them. But General Chanel was an interesting person because he's a man of few words. If you ever read his book called The Way of a Fighter, which is his memoirs, uh, he's a man of, he, there's not a lot of verbiage. I mean, he's right to the point all the time. And, uh, I remember some of the things that he told me. One of the things that always impressed me, he said, Texas, he said, if you want to teach a dog tricks, he said, first you've got to be smarter than the dog. And, uh, Pretty basic, uh, and uh, anyway, another thing that I remember about him: we went down to a base in Guaylin. Uh, uh, we just got <coughs> moved my squadron there, and we went down to look it over. Flew in there transport, and uh, I had it revetted and hidden. The Japanese had an air raid, and the and Japanese fighter suite came in, and they did all kinds of acrobatics put on an air show like you wouldn't believe. And then we were up on this uh, karst hill, way in as these, uh, we call them ice cream cone hill. But there was a battery, uh, an aircraft battery up there. Well, Chanel just could hardly stand it. He said, man, he said, we're going to do something. He told the battery command, why don't you shoot at that guy? They'll come in right over, you know. And the battery command told him, he said, if we shoot at that guy, man, they'll come back in and beat us up. And uh, Shalom said, don't you know if you shoot the guy down, he can't come back. And that's the way his mind worked. You know. <laughs> but he was a terrific guy. And uh, his tactics were so good that uh, uh, everything he told us to do, and actually his directives were very simple. He said, I want you guys to get out there and kill as many Japs as you can. And, you know, that was it. And he just turned us loose to any way we could do it. And, uh, the uh, tactical lectures are the thing that saved us. We, uh, uh, the tactics were simple. Uh, he said, just don't turn with these guys. He said, if you do, you're going to get shot down. All the Japanese aircraft that we encountered, they could uh, uh, turn inside of us. And uh, so the point is that if you try to turn with a guy, you can't turn with him and you lead off the airspeed and you can't pick it up fast enough once you find out you can't turn inside of the guy then you try to get away and then this guy is light wing loading and real positive thrust on it he can pull on you before you can spool up even though we had the speed advantage you still got to get rolling you know to, just like a jet I think some of these 262's in the Europe I think that's the way they got shot down maybe trying to dogfight with a P-38 say and a P-38, you know, for a short burst, well, they got real posture thrust, and they could pull on this guy for you and get away. But we uh, had very good luck, and one of the things, though, that were bad, they, they never disseminated that information to the people back home. Chenault sent the tactics back to the War Department, and they never disseminated it. Well, those guys down the Pacific, same equipment we have, they lost the practically lost all of them, the P-40s down there, because they tried to, it's just natural for a fighter pilot to try to dogfight and get around on a guy's tail. But a better way to do it. And it was that simple tactic. First indication I had of what war is all about, after we finished our training, I deployed one squadron down the range and the third squadron, and then the, we were in central Burma when the Japanese hit uh, uh, Kunming. Well, the next day, we we were there. I mean, 
we, uh, the Japanese came in with ten bombers, no escort. They just used Kunming as a bombing target. And they just bombed right in the city. There was no other target to bomb. And uh, so we, we moved the two squadrons in there the next day. And the next morning when they came in, they <coughs> had no escort and they didn't know that we were there. Just another routine deal. Well, we intercepted them about 40 miles out, and we shot four down right there, close to the field, and the rest of them, uh, only one got back. He never got back to his base, but uh, uh, the others all went down on the way home. So they never came back again while we were there. That was the first thing they did. And uh, so they... Uh, Chanel was delighted, of course, you know. And then, very shortly after that, on the 23rd of uh, December, the guys down at Rangoon, they came in and said they were going to wipe them out, and they came in and ran 80 or 100 airplanes. And uh, the guys met them. And my friend Duke Hedman, he, he became an ace that day. He uh, shot down five. They sent a gunnery officer over there from the state to find out what kind of tactics were using it. And they interviewed uh, Duke, and, uh, and, and Duke's a funny guy from uh, North Dakota. And he said, he said, well, he said, all you do, he said, you just drive up about 50 feet behind him, and he said, you hold the trigger down until he drops, and then you move over on the next one. Well, they shot everything off his airplane. I mean, the windscreen, everything. That air airplane was total. I mean, but he, uh, it was really funny. Then they came back again on the 25th, Christmas Day. And the same thing happened, except they lost a whole lot more airplanes that day. The guys were beginning to get trail-wise, you know. That's the first contact and for the third squadron. So then the uh, third squadron pulled out, and they didn't come back again. Uh, my squadron came down to relieve them on New Year's Eve. And... Uh, so then they came back on, I believe it was on the 2nd of January. And, uh, but we, then we had a lot of combat for the next uh, month down there with the guy. But anyway, uh, as a result of those tactics, uh, we only lost four pilots in aerial combat. And, and uh, we had others shot down, ground fire, and some of them shot down, uh, uh, but made it back, but they weren't killed. But we didn't lose a whole lot of people, and uh, they paid us, uh, they honored those bonuses, and they paid paid us uh, uh, for 297 airplanes, which, which is a uh, pretty good record. And I don't think it'll ever be me. I don't know how many airplanes we shot down with. There were so many airplanes that would come in there, and you couldn't tell unless the guy just, because the tactics were just to hit the guy and, go right out and go right down and come back, get some speed and come back and hit him again. And uh, so we don't know, like these bomber formations, I know one of them that I was uh, working on uh, one time, there were seven bombers and they were in a big V. And these guys would never break, never break uh, the uh, formation. And we started working on them in a big V and you just keep and they keep dropping off, dropping off. But you make several passes, you don't know who got them. I, ha I know I got, well, I know the last three who got those because I got the third to the last one. And there was a Brewster Buffalo who got uh, the second to the last and Bob Neal got the last one. Well, they blew up right in front of us. But a matter of fact, that I almost got me. I mean, the debris off of that bomber I knocked a big hole in my wing. In. But we were... It got like shooting doves around a tank. Yeah. You know, all of our fighting was a fighter pilot's dream in the early days. We were doing all the fighting over our own field or very close to the field. Uh, we had, uh, when you'd go into, move into a base, and this would be the base you'd move into, put a map on the wall, and you'd draw concentric circles on out to 300 kilometers. And so every village in China, Chenault had equipped with the uh, CW, dot or dot dip, or some had voice radio. But 
<coughs> all the villager had to do was to say what he saw or what he heard. I see something, whatever he saw, so many airplanes, or if he heard engine noise or anything, put a flag right on that village. And pretty soon those flags line up, and then we knew they were coming in. It was so accurate, you can't believe it. And so then uh, they get in the, uh, 150 kilometers would give us a chance to get up to uh, about 18,000 or 20,000. And they would be there. I mean, it was right on the money. But it's also used for lost pilots. If they got lost, the procedure was the first village you came to, you fire a short burst, and that information goes right into the center thing here. You don't know where you are, but they know where that village is, and they give you a vector off of that, and you come on in. So it's simple, but it's, you know, it worked as of. Uh, Oh, back in April, actually, when Shaw got his commission uh, uh, as a brigadier general in the U.S. Army, we knew that our end was very close. And, uh, so uh, it was decreed that uh, July 42 would be, we'd get no further support. That would be the end of the AVG. So 42 comes around. And uh, July 42 comes around, and there's nobody there to take over the airplane, just walk off and leave them. So the general asked me to go out and talk to people for volunteers. And my squadron agreed to extend the contract for two weeks. And so did uh, Bob Neal's squadron, the first, and the third squadron, always, uh, they went home. But anyway, at the end of that two weeks, they still didn't have the experience. There were people coming in, but they had no experience level, like I said. Uh, that was good enough to, to function in that environment. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, the general asked me if I'd take a, a spot commission coming out of the Air Corps, because I was going back to the Navy. And, uh, I said, I knew his problem. So I said, yes, I would. And I got uh, Ed Rector and and Gilbright and Sawyer and Gajemaf, but uh, five pilots and 22 ground people agreed to take spot commissions and <clears throat> come into the Army Air Corps. So we, uh, uh, so I came down off a flight and uh, uh, said, take your old sign here. You're now Major Hill, 75th Fighter Squadron. You know, the Flying Tigers uh, had to be disbanded because there was no way that you could take military units uh, to build up in China. Uh, there was no way to, uh, to take military units to work with them. That was the trouble. The Army wanted to uh, see we were Army, Army Air Corps. So they didn't want to... Uh, uh, we had plans for a follow-on uh, uh, volunteer group, bomber group. And uh, we had followed. They were already, some of them already on the way over there, but they decreed that uh, we're not going to do that. So the Army, you couldn't have guys making the kind of money we were making, you know, and here's some GI got his name, uh, or got his life on the line, you know, for nothing. But uh, the reason uh, they, we could operate uh, so efficiently with practically nothing, you know. For instance, I had 45 ground personnel roughly when our group broke up and 25, uh, say, uh, pilots. And uh, when the, the 75th Fighter Squadron that I activated the next day when I became ground, required 250-some ground personnel and 35 officers. Well, hump tonnage was the only way we got any kind of supplies over there. And it was very, very critical. So. But it just wasn't practical to do that. Um, uh, well, the transition was real simple. All I did, I came down, I was squadron leader, and I came down, said, take your old sign here, you and now Major Hill, 75th Fighter Squadron, just put on a different hat doing the same thing I did the day before. No physical, no nothing. I, I thought to myself, well, you know, when you're drowning and the log floats by, you don't ask how big it is. And, and you'd be surprised how many roofs can be broken <laughs> when you... We didn't get to 51s until uh, uh, 
latter part of 43. Well, the transition was, uh, it was very easy. I mean, the P-51 was a very easy airplane to fly. And, uh, <clears throat> but we got the old A models first, which uh, came out of Barstow, Florida. The guys had trained in them. They all beat up. And I took the first runs into combat. And uh, that's where we ran into this new, uh, they call it a Tojo. We didn't have code name. I didn't know what it was. All I knew it was airplane, Japanese aircraft I'd never seen before. And uh, I had four guys, uh, three guys with me, and we went down to Canton, uh, Hong Kong area. And I saw these guys above us and pulled up into them and called them out and pulled into them. And they saw me and they went straight up and I went up and couldn't stay with them. <clears throat> so we pushed over, they pushed over and shot the three guys down with me and got on me and riddled me and I just barely got home. And, uh, that's the other thing that Chenault was so good about. I, uh, uh, to the point, he, I told him, I said, General, I said, we ran into a type. I don't think we're going to beat these guys in the air. Said, oh, hell, Texas, don't worry about it. He said, get them on the ground. He said, then you don't have to fight them in the air. And that was his solution to all of these problems, you know. What and that's it? exactly what we did. We went into these fields, found out where they were coming out of it. God, we, I think we got something like 70 some of them. We're fly, flying four or five missions a day, pilots, and when the Japs were coming down to take over East China. And uh, that's where we really got some pretty heavy losses because it's all ground strafing. And uh, you know, I mean, our guy, after 100 missions, his chances of surviving another 10 missions are practically nil. So anyway, uh, I, the 75th Fighter Squadron, we had a bunch of good guys. Some of these guys, you know, Don Lopez was in my squadron over there, you know. I thought he'd lied about his age. Uh, he, he looked like he was about 16 years old. But in the meantime, I'd moved up as a group commander by that time. Later on, as I moved on up, I had a lot of knowledge of future planning and stuff. And they didn't want you flying over enemy lines where you'd be captured, you know. And, uh, so I was restricted to trying to do some night interceptions, and uh, which was pretty hairy. We shot down the first bombers at night with the day fighter Johnny Allison and the Ajax bomber. And uh, but you know I've been up at night and, and you, you go through a slipstream. You know, you, you chance for a mid-air collision is pretty good. I don't know what system the Marines use, but. Uh, but uh, we had a regular night fighter. Uh, but Johnny Alston, these guys shot over the night, they bright moonlight night. Uh, they come in and bomb the end formation, had to run the lights on. But after that first night that we ever tried that, we shot those three bombers down. <coughs> they, never, they never came back at night with any lights on. Do you have any particular memory that stands out foremost in your mind? Well, the camaraderie of our guys, we had some awful good people. Our ground, our ground personnel were superb people. And uh, uh, the hardcore of our pilots, uh, we're like family. People who've been around our group know that we are like family, and we have like a family reunion. You know, people don't, are not rotating through you all the time, you know. It's just, you know, we're all in the same boat together. And we were there for a period of time, and. And we've kept in touch with each other. We've taken care of a lot of the widows and orphans, and, and uh, we have money in the till, and, and so we, we we we've been together. A lot of us been together for 64 years. You know, a lot of us went through training together. So, uh, but and you know, another thing that's probably interesting that uh, you ought to know about is that uh, uh, just to give an idea of the caliber of people we had there, like. Uh, Start with Gerhard Newman. Uh, I don't know what people know him not, but he was a German national that we picked up over there, and he was one of our crew chiefs. I remember he was working on automobiles and whatnot. Well, so when our group broke up, he came into the Army Air Corps in our 23rd Fighter Group, and this guy put together our first hero, and uh, Johnny Allison flew it, and, 
uh, he had to improvise uh, all the sheet metal work and the hydraulic stuff. And, and on, I remember the hydraulic failed on that first and couldn't get his gear done. Got one down. And Johnny Allison, being a superb pilot, he he set it down where where minimum damage. He rebuilt it again and brought it back to the States, and they're going to deport him because he's a German national. He's a master sergeant in their army. And uh, got a hold of Tommy Corcoran. He got an instant citizenship. Tommy Corcoran is uh, Roosevelt's right-hand man, known as Tommy the Court. Got instant citizenship. I wrote a letter for him for a job with, GI, uh, with GE. And uh, he, <coughs> he uh, the next time I saw him, I heard from him periodically. Forty-four years ago, when they had the unveiling of the T-38, the one some of you guys flew, and that was the first supersonic fighter. And it was 44 years ago, and Johnny Allison was vice president north of them. I looked over at this <coughs> shindig they had down in San Antonio, and I said, that's Gerhard Newman over there. What the hell is he doing here? He said, he designed the engine that's in that airplane. Got the Collier Trophy that year. Well, anyway, he went on to become chief of all the power plant, head of all the power plant division of GE. So you can imagine a crew chief for that kind of talent. We had good help there. Bob Prescott founded Flying Tiger Line, built the biggest freight carrier in the world, which is now FedEx. After he, when he died, that's when it passed into FedEx. Uh, we had uh, Moose Moss from Doran, Georgia. He trained a lot of Olympic divers. We had 14 pilots who were captain of, on Pan Am. We had uh, a lot of guys that flew the hump and stayed over there flying supplies to us. Uh, Dick Rossi, for instance, he made 700 and some trips across the hump. Uh, and uh, then uh, they formed CAT, uh, an alt airline after the war and uh, a lot of our guys were cat pilots and they just uh, really uh, uh, Chuck Older he was a little marine and became a federal judge he's a guy tried Manson uh, and he started Manson started acting up in his court and he said tie that mother up <laughs> tied him up <laughs> but uh, let's see uh, uh it just, I mean, it's just a heck of a lot of talent in my doctor. The other thing is, it's amazing how a guy like Chenoa can take a diverse group of people, Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, and mold them into the finest fighting outfit in the world. I mean, it, it's amazing. But uh, it's one of the few things I ever did in my life I wasn't sorry for, and one of them was Mary Maisie, and the other one was joining the Flying Tigers.